I'm so grateful for an opportunity to speak to you, always, always, always. Leanne and I had the distinct pleasure of being able to run up to Grand Junction and be a part of uh, the night, not part of as in on the stage, we got to take in the uh, Night Vision Christian Music Festival, and that was cool. It's really cool to be able to sing with six or 7,000 of your closest friends. And uh, we actually sang King of Kings. It was great out there in the middle of God's country. It was awesome. While I was gone and had some windshield time, I was thinking about you and trying to pray for each one of you by name, your families by name. I care about you. I love you. I want God's very best for you. I also was praying that we'd have some guests here today, either in the online campus or Cortez campus, for the very first time. And if this is your first time to be here, I am so grateful to you, uh, like I said, for taking some time. Um, I know that uh, religion and so forth can get you so distracted and so confused, and that's why I say I don't really put much stock in religion, but I definitely put a whole lot of stock in a good relationship with Jesus Christ. So if you want to keep hanging out with us and trying to grasp what Jesus had to say and keep following him and asking tough questions, that's what we want to do too. We want to keep following Jesus. That's why after we're done with this, we have a break, we're going to have some lunch, and then we'll jump, jump into the summit. The, the, the summit was designed and, and put together, and this one especially, so that we can encourage one another to keep serving Jesus uh, with a humble and surrendered heart, we want to do it better and better. We want to put a sharper edge on everything that we do because we believe that Jesus is the hope of the world and that if you've been beat down, you need some hope. And Jesus is that. We want Rock Springs and the Rock Springers that are a part of it to be, we want to be dispensing hope to people. Not ourselves, it's not about us, about Him. Uh, so that's what we're going to do. And we, we, love, we, we love conversations. We're all about the relationships. That's why we have the Church Center app. You can ask for prayer. You can find out what's going on. But you can also get connected by letting us know who you are, a little bit about you, and start a conversation. We think we ought to be a safe place to hear a dangerous message. Um, let me ask you a question to get you thinking in the right direction for today. Is there anything that you don't know? No. <laughs> One honest answer. <laughs> no, there's a, a, a little bit of a humor to that, isn't there? Like, well, yeah, there's a ton of stuff I don't know. But see, this is where the honorary side of me is like, well, how do you know that there are things that you don't know? I don't know. <laughs> so, see, at least one thing you don't know, right? This is important, and it's important for you to get in the right frame of mind, just like last week's, like, don't bother about what other people believe or what they're doing. I just want you to think about you, your stuff, your thoughts, your knowledge, or as we've been talking about in this series about uh, having a foolproof life, um, what don't you know? What is that thing that you don't know? Are you missing out on the things that really matter by collecting a lot of stuff that you know about stuff that doesn't really matter at all? It's like I've been climbing this ladder and only got to the top and realized it was leaning up against the wrong wall. It's like, egad, that's a bad situation. And the question is, how do you know, how do you get to know what you don't know? This series has been about one single question. And for those of you who love to get the Sunday School pins, I'm going to ask you what it is here in a minute, and we're, hopefully you can say it before it's ever up on the screen. But that one single question that we've spent, this will be the fifth installment, fifth episode. We've got one more uh, this next Sunday. The single question, if you can ask it and honestly answer it, I have found in my own experience and in the experience of so many others that you can reduce the level of regret you have in your life. I want you today, even if it's painful, I want you to, right now, ponder your greatest regret. You don't have to tell anybody else about it, but I just need you to feel that. I need you to think about it. If only you had had wisdom, there is a 90% chance you could have avoided that greatest regret. That's what I mean by foolproofing. And this question sets you up with the potential in your relationships, parent-child, husband and wife, 
boss, employee, friend to friend. It can set you up to have less stress in your money management. For some of us, we needed God's wisdom whenever our pace of our life was out of control. Because some of us go out of control by going 110%. We turn it up to an 11, okay? Or some people, the pace of life is not fast enough, but what was the wise pace is what we should have been asking. Because this is the question about our time. We dealt with that a couple of weeks ago. About our health. It, it just encompasses so many things. Should I stay? Should I go? Should I spend that money? Should I save that money? Should I take that job? Should I move on to another job? What about all of my relationships? It just goes everywhere. So for six weeks, what I'm basically trying to do is to make it so pervasive in what we're talking about that just like, I cannot get this question out of my mind. Well, good. I hope it'll be a question that you ask. Till your dying day. Now, for those of you, like I said, who love to get all the, you know, your teacher's pet and all that kind of stuff, without even seeing it on the screen, do you remember what that question is? What is the wise thing to do? Woo! Sunday school pins for everybody! <laughs> and then I'll throw 100,000 points in on top of that because they're free and, uh, yeah, okay. That is the truth. What is the wise thing to do? Say it out loud with me. What is the wise thing to do? Now, this applies to everyone, whether you're a Jesus follower yet or not, it still applies. This, this collection of 66 ancient writings that have proven the test of time, they both speak of it just blatantly and directly, and they also just inherently refer back to it, even if it's indirectly. That, that wisdom is a good thing. If you're not a Jesus follower, this is optional. I would say consider it, try it, won't hurt you. It's not going to cost you anything. It might actually make your life a little bit better. But if you are a Jesus follower, and I assume that a lot of us in the online or here in person, a lot of us say we are Christ followers. And if that's the case, then this is standard operating procedure. This is the prime directive. We are to live a life that goes above and beyond just what is right and wrong. It is what we are expected to do. That's why we expanded on it just a little bit. And that is on the screen as well. And that is, in light of my past experience, my current circumstances, and my future hopes and dreams, what's the wise thing for me to do? It's there on the screen. Read it with me. In light of my past experience, current circumstances, and future hopes and dreams, what's the wise thing for me to do? You can ask this because it is your past, your current situation, your future hopes and dreams. It doesn't mean you get to pick what is right and wrong. It's depending on what chapter of life you are either coming out of, in, or a hope to be in, it actually impacts the timing of doing the right thing, avoiding the wrong thing. In light of my past experience, current circumstances, future hopes and dreams, what is the wise thing for me to do? Now, last Sunday was fun. You know, we had a marathon service because we went on for like, uh, I don't know, 17 hours is I think what it felt like. Okay. No, uh, I've gotten a lot of feedback on that. It's an awkward conversation about how do you apply wisdom, God's wisdom, into uh, our sexual drive, our, our, our sexual being. And since God's the one who thought that up, we just want to see what did he have to say about that. And it impacts us at every age. Talked about that last Sunday in terms of Whenever it comes to that and so many other things, particularly having to do with money, sex, or power, we tend to be tempted to stop. We stop just short of asking this question, what is the wise thing to do? What we ask instead is, what's the right thing to do? And our alternate to that is, well, there's nothing wrong with, and you fill in the blank. We tend to stop short and we say, you know what? I just need to know, is this legal? Is this legal? Or am I getting in trouble if I do this? Or is like uh, another question or a ver variation of that is, is this permissible to do? That's why we said standing on the edge of the ledge is like how close to the edge can I get without going over and still be called a Christian or do what is wise? And we said that wise people draw back and create a, a really good margin in whatever area of their life so that their life continues to be wise. We've call we're called to a higher level of living. Higher level living. It's not, was there anything wrong with that? Or it, there's nothing wrong with that. 
I hope you're still, at least kind of at the back of your mind, still thinking about your greatest regret. Because it probably involved a season of your life, it involved a weekend of your life, it involved a conversation of your life. That chapter back in those days, whenever that was, whether it was 10 years ago or 10 days ago, we have regrets. And what we say to ourselves is, man, I sure wish I could go back and change that. Or I wish I had a do-over. And God does give grace, and He gives mercy, and He wipes the slate clean. But the consequences of choices in the past, they still live with us. You can't change that. You're a product of your past, but you're not a prisoner of it. The fact is, we wish we could go back and change. Particularly in the areas, am I right, of money? It's like, man, I wish I had that money. I wish I had some money. <laughs> but it's like, oh, that guy or that girl, they, 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 they made such a wonderful sales pitch, and I gave them all my money to that Nigerian prince, and it just like, uh, and now I can't get it back. You go, man, I wish I could go back. I wouldn't do that that way. What about invitations to certain things, some spring break trip to a party, to this, this thing is like, oh man, what I did or who I met, that changed the direction of my life and it wasn't good. Um, relationships that we wish we hadn't started. Or relationships that's like, once we saw the red flags, it's like, why didn't we have this, the sense to go, okay, done, out of here. Sayonara, you know? The things that we spent, the things that we accepted, the things that we should have stayed out of. Let me just call it. Do you have any dumb decisions that you've made? I know it's church and you're not supposed to say, you know, inflammatory words. Have you ever done anything stupid? Everybody's been stupid. Raise their hand. Okay, so we're all there. That's a given. And I kind of established that from the very get-go of this series. But here's the question I really want us to drill down into today, and that is, why? Why do we do those things? You know, the like, country song, I know, what I, I, I know what I was feeling, but what was I thinking? In fact, that's what I put on the screen. How could I have been so foolish is what we ask ourselves. Or the other variation of that, I should have seen it coming. Should have seen it coming. Did you ever said those words? Yeah, of course. Should have seen that coming. Hindsight's twenty twenty. If I'd known then what I know now, I would have done things so differently. But how could I have been so stupid? How could I have been so foolish? Why is that? Because if you ask the question, I should have seen it coming, there are so many implications to you asking that question, me asking that question. Because when you ask that question, you are saying, yeah, hindsight's twenty twenty. But what you're also saying is, if I'd actually been paying attention, I can see now there were plenty of clues. Because how many of you go, oh man, I should have seen it coming, and you look back on it, it's like, oh, mama said, mama said, daddy said, grandmama said. Well, what was I thinking? Should have seen it coming. You know, if I'd only looked a little bit more closely at the fine print in that sales document, <laughs> I didn't realize they were going to take my firstborn. I still have my money if I had just paid attention to what that salesman was actually doing, that spin he was putting on that. Yeah, if only I'd paid attention. Man, there were so many red flags with that girl. I should have seen that coming. Okay. If you, here, listen, listen, we're building a case here. If you should have seen it coming, but you didn't, that does not imply, does not mean, that somebody didn't see it coming. It just wasn't you that saw it. Okay? Again, I say, in case you didn't know whether you're a guy or a girl, your mama has been seeing it coming for years. She started seeing it coming whenever she knew she was carrying you. And then when you came out and she started dressing you up, she had everything planned out. She saw everything coming. Okay? And yet, whenever your mama, especially whenever you were hit about 12 years old, your mama told you something like, talk to the hand, talk to the hand. Right? Couldn't tell you anything. Here's the thing. If you should have seen it coming, 
what you need to pay attention to right now, because it still applies today going forward. If you should have seen it coming, chances are somebody around you does see it coming or did see it coming, which means either back in the day, either you didn't listen or nobody warned you. And I would have to say, the chances are that nobody warned you. You don't live under a rock and you don't live in a cave. And if you've got anybody who has any shred of emotion about you, they saw it come in. Because, I mean, seriously, we look at other people's lives and it's, it, it's, it's just as clear. It's clear. Why are you doing that? You know, that's what we say under our breath. Sometimes we actually say it to them. They probably... Uh, you know what they were trying to get you to do? They were just actually trying to get you to listen. That's all. They just wanted you to listen. But we don't want to listen. We don't want to listen. We get together. Have you ever been a part of a group of people who care about someone else and you're, your little cluster of people, not them because they're not listening to you, you get together with your little cluster of people. It might be a husband and wife for their kid. It might be just a whole family and somebody else. We say, well, you know, somebody ought to tell her. He's like, Okay, do the thumbs up. Okay, you're the last one, so you, you, you got to go tell her. It's like, no, I'm going to go tell her. Mm. No, she's like Katie Kaboom. Mm-mm, mm-mm, no, sir. Not going to tell her. You got to tell her. We got to tell her. And then somebody says, well, I, I would go tell her, but honestly, he's not going to listen. It's just a waste of breath. We care about you. Everybody cares about you. They care about me, and yet sometimes they get together in a little huddle, and they, they say, God, would they just please get through their thick head? Because you remember, it not only started when you were about 12, 13 years old. Man, you were so smart whenever you were in high school. Too cool for school. Because you got your license. And I know that feeling. I started driving when I was 12. I'm like, I was looking for whatever state would give me a driver's license when I was 14 years old. Let's do it. Put the pedal to the metal. Let's do it. In high school, and the, 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 you know, the, the world is yours. There is nothing wrong with any of that. Talked about that a couple of Sundays ago. There is nothing wrong with it because we're all born simple. And you start adding to. But whenever you in high school think you've got it all figured out and mama or daddy tries to tell you a thing or two, you're not listening, so what do you do? You go and make the same dumb, stupid mistakes that other people ahead of you have done. When you could have, see, there's only two ways to learn. You learn whenever you see the light or feel the heat. Right? When people are who you respect or at least say, well, they're, you know, they're not in jail and they're still alive, that's good. That's, that's a good start. I, I should listen to them. Whenever you listen to them, you're seeing the light. But most of us like, nope, going to feel the heat. Got to go and burn ourselves on the stove ourselves. Y'all, y'all tracking with me? This is how we roll. Then you think, well, it'll get better as soon as you get out of high school. <laughs> yeah. And then you get to the drinking age, which that's funny because, well, anyway, people have already tried that before they, it, yeah. Then you, go, you do realize your frontal lobes do not solidify until you're around 26 years old. <laughs> that's why, isn't it amazing that our parents let us get married at 20 and 21? That's crazy. What were they thinking? That's crazy. Should have seen that coming. (laughs) I love our amen section right here. I do. (laughs) Just saying, whether it was in high school, whether it was your college situation, or you got out and, man, you were large and in charge, you were going to take over the world with whatever it is you decided to do. Nobody could tell you anything because you already knew it. The thing is, is that you have come to understand you didn't know everything and you didn't know what you didn't know, but that goes back to what I said. It's either because you didn't listen because there had to have been somebody along the way that was telling you a thing or two. You either didn't listen or nobody warned you, which raises a very big, actually this is the bigger question we need to. Why can't I see it coming? But they can. So, I mean, is it hidden? Is it a mystery? Is it like wordle? Got to figure it out? 
Why can I see it coming in your life, but I can't see it coming in my life? Because this applies to me. I do not have a lock on this. But it's so weird. Why can't I see it, but you can? Why can you see it, but I can't? Depending on which direction we're looking. Because the fact is, I know exactly what you should do. But you don't. I joked with Leanne the other day. I've made a living out of giving people opinions that they readily ignore. <laughs> That's a reason to get up in the morning, isn't it? You know what I'm saying? I still do counseling, but it's the funniest thing. I have actually sat in counseling with Leanne and the counselor because we were in such a bad way. We had to have some new tools, didn't know what we were doing. We did have the sense to get in out of the rain and figure it out with their help. So I know all that deal. But whenever you come to me with your marriage problems, I do look at you with a, I love you with the love of the Lord. Look. I'm just waiting for you to stop talking because really there's only three problems in marriage. And I can tell you, if y'all just sit still and take notes, I'll give you about five paragraphs, three points, and a poem. Now go and do what I just told you to do and your marriage is be fantastic i mean how many times have you sat with someone whose marriage is in inflamed in, in over something and you're st- you know both of them and they're sitting there and he's doing that thing and she's doing that thing and you want to go time out that thing you're doing don't do that ever again <laughs> boom done solved your problem and you you need to start doing this done that's it solved I know exactly what you should do. You know exactly what I should do. And yet we don't do it. And it's not because we don't care. We do want it to work. Whatever it is, raising kids, managing our money, uh, uh, trying to have a better uh, set of relationships. Everybody cares because who really wants to go through their life like, wow, that's another regret I can add to my whole collection. Regret after regret after regret. And yet, that's what drives us to say, how could I have been so foolish? How could I have missed that? Why didn't I see that coming? I'm just telling you, there's a clue in here, and I want, that's why I want you to think about your greatest regret. If you think about the decisions that led to your greatest regret, I guarantee you, there is a situation in which you overreacted, or you underreacted, You said yes with such intensity and it was the wrong time to say yes and it was the wrong time to say it with such intensity. Or you said no with such intensity and at the wrong time. (laughs) I guarantee you there was something in you that was so passionate about the decision you were making and though you look back on it now with regret, you're like, I mean it. That is a big, big clue as to why it goes like it does. Because this is something you have to understand about us as human beings. God gave us emotions. He gave us these passions about things. And they are beautiful when they are brought under his control. But out of control, man, they are like small children with power tools. Okay. Your personal decisions, whenever you're making decisions about other people or other things in your life that you care deeply about or that are so primary to you, your personal decisions are emotional by nature. And some of you guys are going, okay, well, this is where I check out because I don't have any emotions. <laughs> yeah, you do. You just express them differently than the girls do. Okay? Okay. You say, I'm not emotional. Mm, Okay, well, follow me here. Personal decisions, yours and mine, they always come with emotions attached. I put it on the screen, and that is, any emotionally charged uh, environments are not ideal for making your best decisions. It's the truth. Personal decisions have to do with the things that matter to you. 
You might have to examine what matters to you and make some adjustments, but I'm simply saying your personal decisions have to do with stuff you care about. That It's about the people, the people in your life, your kids, and sometimes your parents, your friends, your brothers, your sisters, your boss, your employee. Uh, it always has to do with the people, or another one I've noticed is it has to do with the pleasures that we enjoy. Don't you be messing with stuff that makes me happy. Mm-mm. Or it has to do with our possessions, because a lot of us think, you know, he who dies with the most toys wins. <laughs> nope, I've done enough funerals. He who dies with the most toys dies. That's it. So it's either the people, the possessions, the pleasure, the power, the influence that we have over other people, that's what it always seems to come back to. So what's happening when you make decisions in any one of those things, in any one of those areas of your pleasure, possessions, power, whatever it may be, you always have something that's working against you when you're making those personal decisions. And that primary thing that's working against you is you. You've heard the term, you're your own worst enemy. That's what they mean. You're making dumb decisions because you're, more or less, you're reacting to what's going on instead of actually responding to it. Here's another way of saying it. It's just the fact that our emotions make the obvious less obvious. Your feelings about those possessions or the power that you perceive that you have or the people that you feel like you have control over. Here's the thing. <laughs> Your emotions create like a fog. It's a fog that seems to surround you and you can't see straight. You can't see your way through. Your emotions create fog for you. But see, your emotions about the decisions you're trying to make do not make a fog around me because I don't have any attachment to it. You are under this storm cloud of all this stuff that's it's just raging. Everything's fly, flying off the walls and I'm sitting there listening to you because I love you and I'm like, I'm like a bird up in the sky. I'm flying high above your storm. Here's what you need to do. Why don't you just go and do that? And that kind of gets on your nerves because like, I am hurting so bad. It's like, you shouldn't be hurting so bad. It's not that big a deal. <laughs> like, it's not a big deal to you. This may be the explanation as to why a lot of you might not be the best managers of your own money. But you probably do really, really good at managing mine. Because, I mean, think about it. Whenever you have little kids, did you know that Walmart and all the other retailers put all that stuff at, well, at my eye level? <laughs> because me and my peeps, while we're standing there, it's like we can see all the toys, the gums, the stuff. It's like, it's like I got to have that, I got to have that, I got to. Well, see, you don't have any personal attachment to that, but your kids, they love it. And they go, I'm going to have to have that. And you go, no, that is, that is an impulse buy. We do not, come on, let's go. It's clear for you. We do not need that. You do not need, I know that's your allowance money, but it's, you don't need it. Put it back, put it back. Or they start screaming, it's like, okay, I'll buy it for you if you just please shut up. You know, that's, that's how we do it. Same thing. And it, 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 you never outgrow that. You never outgrow that kind of thing because it has to do with what you see and what you want. Ladies, am I right? He's like, you might be married to a full-grown man, but he sees that truck or that boat or that gun. He's like, I gotta have it. I gotta have it. I gotta have it. And then he starts throwing a fit whenever he's like, nope, not gonna get it. Come on, we're getting out of here. Okay. It's easy for someone else to reel you in because they don't have any fog that is surrounding them because of their emotions that are attached. Like I said, you might not know what to do with your own marriage, but you know, see, 
Isn't it funny how you can sit out on your porch and you can be rocking, going, I don't know what we're going to do about our marriage. But you look over at the neighbors like, you know what? They need to do this and they need to do that and they need to do that. And maybe they would start getting together. Because all they're doing is creating a ruckus around here. It's the very same principle as to why your kids, they're going to give you an aneurysm, right? But you know exactly how to discipline everybody else's kids. Those, those kids, they just need a spanking. When your appetites, when our appetites are stirred, we can hardly see straight. We can hardly see straight about our stuff, about the people in our life, about getting appropriate recognition because we get all bowed up if somebody doesn't give us the right. And we, get, we, we can't see straight about what, what, where the power center is. We just got to be right. Emotional fog. Emotions fog your judgment. Why? Because the Bible, I'm just saying, I don't know what you believe about God, Jesus, church, the Bible, all that stuff. But the Bible actually talks about it fogs our judgment with things like lust and anger and jealousy and insecurity and arrogance and all these kinds of things. There's so much going on here. It is actually next to impossible to hear the voice of wisdom when the emotions of everything are ringing in your ear. So, that's the backdrop of understanding what we're dealing with, and we've got to come to terms with this if we're going to allow wisdom to actually bless our lives. I put, it, I put it like this. What's the wise thing to do when emotions are high and our appetites are inflamed? It's a really important question. It's an important question, and it actually has an answer. It has a one-word answer, and this one word... If it applies to anything, it applies to your relationships and it applies to your money so vividly. Because most of us in this room would say, you know what? I don't want to waste any more, money, my, any more of my money. I've already wasted a ton and I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to look back on this chapter and go, Why did, what was I thinking? Why didn't I see that coming? Uh, none of us really want, like, please give me more regrets. Nobody wants to live that way. And the answer is one word. And the word is, listen. Listen. Why is that so hard for us to do? You might not be able to see it coming. Why didn't I see that coming? How could I have been so foolish? You might not be able to see it coming, but I guarantee you, I guarantee you there is someone around you who does see it coming. So I'm saying, if you've got to go to sleep, go to sleep right after this, after you write down. If you want to make the choice that is uh, to be wise, and you want to be a wise guy, you want to be a wise girl, a wise person intentionally hits pause on whatever it is going on in their life, and they listen. That's it. It's not rocket science. It's just tough to do. Wise people know, <laughs> you know that you're getting wiser whenever you actually admit I know that there are things I, I don't know. There's the beginning of wisdom. Here's the other thing you will know that you're getting some wisdom in your life is wise people are not afraid to ask other people for perspective on their life so that they can hear something or learn something and say, oh, I think I can use that. Wise people, wise people, know when they don't know, and they're not afraid to go to people who do know. Because a wise person will go, you know, God created me with emotions. That's not the problem. But my emotions right now are clouding everything that's going on in me. I can't see straight. I'm mad. I'm lonely. I'm, I'm anxious. I'm filling the blank. And so I need someone in my life who is not those things right now. They need to be trustworthy, and they need to be on my side. And believe me, there is someone like that near you. Wise people recognize when they are in no condition to decide for themselves by themselves. It's a matter of learning to listen. I've got to learn to listen. That gives me the ability. I've, I've got to recognize when I am in no condition to decide 
things that are important to me for myself, by myself. This is where we get ourselves into so much trouble, particularly as Americans, particularly as Western United States Americans. We prize an independence, and there's nothing wrong with being able to take care of yourself. But what God called us to do is better than dependence or independence. He called us to interdependence. You need to know when you don't know so that you can ask people around you who do know and they will help you see what you don't know. And I've discovered this through experience that when I surrender to what I just told you because someone taught this to me, when I surrender to this insight that God has given us, I actually do better in my life. But here's the sad thing is that I've also learned painfully that when I ignore this, I pay the price. And if I'm anything like you, I'm pretty sure you're you're, you're saying, I don't want to have more regrets to look back on in the next chapter. I debated about using this, but this song impacted me so many years ago, and I'm not going to sing it for you, but I am going to read the words. It doesn't speak to this in the same words I'm using, but it captures the feeling that I need you to feel with me. And it's called call of the wild he was 21 when he got married his son was born when he was 23 he watched his reckless days of youth turn into years of responsibility his world became routine and he got restless the family ties that bind just tied him down he felt his life was passing him by felt his dreams were crashing to the ground and the grass was looking greener beyond the limits of that simple town Because he wanted a life of adventure, so he left behind a wife and a child. They begged him to stay, but he threw it all away, and he answered the call of the wild. He lived it up out there in Arizona, and he got rowdy down in Tennessee, making up for lost time, crossing the line now that he was free. But when the dust finally settled, he saw just how alone a man can be. But he wanted a life of adventure. And so he left behind a wife and a child. And the freedom he loved, was he was now a prisoner of since he had answered the call of the wild. And somewhere in the darkness, he began to see the light. He wondered what his chances might be to make things right. So he went running back to where he came from in hopes he'd be received like the prodigal son. But in the place he once called home, he found was no longer home to anyone. In a house cold and empty, through the tears he cried, My God, what have I done? But he wanted a life of adventure. So he left behind a wife and a child. Yeah, they begged him to stay, but he threw it all away because he had to answer the call of the wild. Wise people know what they don't know. And they don't hesitate to ask those who do know. But there's one thing that drives that, and we're getting to it right quick. The thing that drives that kind of thing that's represented in that song will undo us each and every time. I'll go back to, but we could choose. We could choose to be wise. Because wise people know they don't know all they need to know. And then they go and find people who do know. I want us to check in because some of you are going, you've not gotten to the Bible in any of the things you said today. This is just a large counseling session. Okay. God's counsel comes to us in so many different ways. Let's go hang out with a guy for just a few minutes from a guy who knows. He is purported to have been one of the wisest men who ever lived. That's not just a, a biblical claim. That's uh, historical Measurable fact. He was the third king of a tiny nation, but super influential nation called Israel about 3,000 years ago. And he ruled. He was a king, boy king, who grew up and lived a long life. He ruled as king of Israel during the golden age of Israel. And it's interesting, this fellow has more to say about seeking outside counsel than any other biblical writer. Actually, To my knowledge, he has more to say about wisdom than any ancient writer, period. He was just extraordinarily insightful and wise. 
And those of you who got your Sunday school pen, you know who I'm talking about. His name was Solomon. He was the son of David. He wrote 3,000 years ago because he had the opportunity during such great wealth, such great military victory, such, he just had so much luxury, but he also used it to add to his wisdom. And here's the thing. He was a king, but even today, kings and those who are supposedly at the top of the food chain, kings are not generally known for their willingness to listen to other people. But he repeatedly says it, says it more than any other ancient writer. He says that wise people, the truly wise people, are the people who listen. And they learn, which is interesting because here's a guy who, whenever he was a small child, God said, ask for any gift you want. He didn't ask for a Ferrari. He didn't ask for an Xbox. He didn't ask for a PlayStation. He didn't ask for any of those things. He asked, I want, I want wisdom. And God said, sure, give you, I'll give it to you in abundance. So here's a guy who certifiably needed counsel the least, and yet he wrote about it the most. Interesting. So as a kid, he, he gets this precious gift big time. We're reading about it in 1 Kings because we're reading about him. It says that God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight, and he gave him a breadth of understanding that is as measureless as the sand on the seashore. His fame did spread to all the surrounding nations. You can find this in uh, biblical, I mean, extra biblical history. That people came from all over the known world at that time. They would make trips to go to this tiny nation of Israel and to Jerusalem. And they would get in line and they would say, we need to ask Solomon this particular question because we need insight, we need wisdom. It's just an incredible thing. His fame spread to all the surrounding nations and from all nations people came to listen to Solomon's wisdom sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of his incredible wisdom. By the way, let's just also, I'm going to refer to one of the things that he wrote. He wrote three different of these ancient documents that we have in the Bible, and they are Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, and Proverbs. Now, if you take all three of those together as like a, a, a triple, you know, a, a, a three-part, you will get God's wisdom on practically everything, because Ecclesiastes, like I said, don't you don't want to read it until you turn like 45, 50, because you go, God, this is so down. And yet, those of us who have reached 45 or 50, you read it and you go, I could have written this. This is the way life goes. It's tough. It's like, it's like a vapor, all that stuff. Uh, Song of Solomon, uh, young Jewish boys used to sneak in to try and read the Song of Solomon because they weren't allowed to read it until they were of a certain age because it's about sex. It's interesting. Yeah, see, now it's like, well, I want to become a Bible reader. That's what I'm Okay. <laughs> Uh, And then there's Proverbs, which the first nine chapters have to do with what we've already talked about, and that is wisdom. And then there's this middle section, right, you know, you've you've heard them. There's actually just tons and tons of these one-liners, two-liners, stuff you'd see on your calendar, stuff you'd see on a poster. It is Proverbs. It's, It's wisdom for living. Here in Proverbs, Solomon is dealing with this idea of, why didn't I see it coming? And he's written, I just chose a few of them. There's there's tons more. Solomon knew that you wouldn't see it coming, but someone near you will. And he said, you ought to listen. You ought to listen to them. Listen to what what he says. This was written 3,000 years ago. Proverbs 9, 9. Instruct the wise, and they will be wiser still. If you do not accept instruction, those of you who are Sunday school banner winners, if you do not receive instruction, what does that make you? You're a fool. Because you know better, but you won't listen to it. It's crazy that wise people who already have a collection, they got stuff in their tool belt for living life, and yet they want to go, teach me something. Tell me. What can I learn? Because you think, instructor? Instruct the wise? Wise people still go to school? Absolutely. Instruct the wise and they will be wiser still. Proverbs 1, verse 5. A wise man will hear and increase in learning and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. If you ever have an opportunity to speak to someone that you have deep respect for in whatever field you work in, if you say, could I have just a few moments, maybe an hour of your time, take them to lunch, and let me give you some instruction. Do not ask them. Do not ask them. Tell me great morsels of wisdom. I'm going to write them down. 
If you have the ear of someone that you respect, ask them, tell me your three greatest regrets. Because a wise person will have learned from their regrets and they want you to not make those same regrets. Acquire wisdom. Go and figure it out. Dig it up. Try and figure it out. Pay whatever you've got to pay. Solomon said in Proverbs 12, he said, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. <laughs> Mamas, daddies, you don't want to say your kid's a fool, but sometimes they act the fool, don't they? Say, because just as they're walking out the door for the 15th time, he's like, I guess, look, it's really, don't, don't talk to me. I, I don't need your advice. And as they slam the door, he's like, oh boy, do you need my advice. But you, if you were ever the fool, it's like, nobody could tell you anything because you already knew it. You don't want to hear it. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. Proverbs 15, 22. Plans fail for lack of counsel. It's good to get a bunch of people that you respect around you and say, can you give me your perspective on things? I don't know that I'm going to do everything you tell me, but I need. What can you see that I cannot see? Because plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. Proverbs 19, listen to advice and accept discipline. Ooh, that's a tough one. Listen to advice and accept discipline, and at the end, you will be counted among the wise. Proverbs 13, 10, where there is strife, where there is contention, where there is arguing, where there is so much tension, what does it say? There is pride, because pride says, I got this. Where there is strife, there is pride, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. Wise people recognize that they don't know everything. And they recognize what they do not know, and then they listen to the people who do know that. That has proven true and trustworthy, and, and it over and over and over and over and over and over. And some of you are going, would you please get to something I don't already know? Because I haven't told you anything that you haven't already observed in life. Here's what I want you to observe as we hit the, the runway, as we're coming in for a landing. Here's the man who wrote all of this stuff and benefited so many of us 3,000 years later. But there's a sad note. Solomon, the, the guy who wrote this, who said you ought to seek counsel toward the end of his life. He got it in his mind that he didn't need to do that anymore. And though it was at the golden age and he had everything going for him and everything was prosperous in the country and the military was strong and all this other stuff, he didn't even take his own advice. And he stopped practicing what he preached. And one of the wisest men who ever lived made some of the dumbest decisions that have ever been made. You can read about it. In 1 Kings, he didn't get any counsel. He got into trouble. He wrecked the economy. He wrecked his military. He wrecked his family. And he knew better. A couple of takeaways. Number one, wisdom is a lifelong practice. It has no expiration date. That's why I've, uh, my, my ambition is please keep asking this question for the rest of your life. Number two, if Solomon needed outside counsel, who are we kidding to say that we do not? I'm saying this is important. None of this is new. So what are the obstacles that we can watch out for? Because I always want something practical that we can take with us. The bottom line, what I've been talking to you about is ask for advice. We already know that. I know we know this, but why don't we do it? Here are the obstacles. Several reasons why we push back. Number one, Let's call it presuming. Presuming. We assume, we pre-assume, we already know what the wise people are, in our life are going to say, and we don't want to hear it. Because we've been around the block. We know, we've heard the advice. I'm not going to go ask them. I know what they're going to say because they're going to tell me what I don't want to hear, and so therefore I just avoid talking to them. We presume that we know everything and can see everything. To put it bluntly, biblically speaking, that makes you a fool. Because a fool says, I know, but I don't care. 
But let me ask you a personal question. Wasn't it that attitude and that kind of thinking that actually led you to that disaster of a regret that I've had you think of already? So why would you go back, like we said at the beginning, like a dog to vomit and do it all over again? Because the cost of doing it this time is still going to be as high, maybe higher than it was the last time you bought that. Here's another reason we push back. So I'm saying, don't presume. Be humble, open. Here's the next one. And that is, I would, you know, I'm a preacher, gotta get them all the same letter. The second one is privacy, or so called privacy. <laughs> Ain't nobody else's business. It's my private stuff. We just don't think it's anybody else's business. That's called stinking thinking. That's what I mean by you can be so independent minded that you forget that you're supposed to be interdependent. Because you go, that's my money. I don't want anybody telling me how I'm going to spend my money. Besides, it's my, it's my decision. When I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. <laughs> it's my marriage. It's my kids. It's my decision. The reason I didn't ask you for your advice is I don't want it. I got this. This is my decision, and I am going to decide what is best for me. But see, here's the thing, and we don't have time to make this into a message, but private decisions have public consequences. <laughs> it's the truth. It's the truth. Happens in politics, happens in my life, happens in your life. See, the results of our personal decisions have public uh, implications. You make a personal decision, but it's rarely limited to just you. You're, it has implications on everybody around you. So the results of your private decisions don't stay private. So nobody's business, nobody else's business becomes everybody's business. Here's another one. One more obstacle, and it's the root of all the others. This is what I've been talking to you about the whole time. Solomon said it several times. Pride. Hmm. you can go back and read all those proverbs that I just read to you and there are even more than that because there are hundreds of them in there you can go back and read all those proverbs and read all the extra ones and proverbs and common sense will tell you that pride blocks wisdom pride blocks wisdom pride blocks wisdom my first grade teacher, Mrs. Slocum, told me something I have never, ever forgotten. She said, David, the moment you think you know everything, you know nothing at all. In first grade, what was this woman thinking? <laughs> so here's the subtlety of pride. Listen to me, friends. Pride is sneaky. It's subtle. It's insidious. And it's deadly. Number one, success is intoxicating. So if you do something in your life and you get good at it, <laughs> you're getting drunk on your own Success. Because the more successful you are or you think you are in whatever field it is that you do, the weird thing is, and this is a human condition, you think because you have success in that area that suddenly you have become very wise and successful in every other area of life. Have you ever been in a room with people who are like very, very, very rich? Did you know that money makes you better looking? <laughs> if you're ever hanging out with people who are very, very, very rich, everyone in the room thinks they're the prettiest girl in the room. Oh, <laughs> they laugh, we laugh. I'm like, oh yeah, that's serious. If they get serious, you get serious. I'm just saying, you, if you are ever finding any kind of success, people are treating you that way to some degree. Smartest guy in the room, smartest girl in the room. You go, <laughs> yeah, 
I am. Yeah. I'm writing a book, Humility and How I Achieved It. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> See, you get successful in one area and you think you don't need to listen anymore. Because success in any area gives you an inflated sense of your own brilliance. You say, okay, that's far off and distant. I don't hang out with those kind of people. Okay, let's just get down and dirty. Men, let me just ask you a question. You think that because you were a kid once, that you know how to be a really good and excellent father. And you don't need anybody to teach you what it means to be a good dad. That's pride. And it's about as logical as saying, I had surgery once. So I'm, I'm good to do surgery. <laughs> Ladies, just because you grew up in a home that had a bad marriage does not automatically and naturally make you a wonderful marriage counselor on how to have a great marriage. Because we don't know what we don't know, but wise people see, I don't know what I need to know, and I'm going to go find some help. And it applies to men, it applies to women, it applies to people who are older, it applies to people who are younger. You just, it's so easy to say, I've been through something, I, I, I lived through it, I, I am successfully on the other side. Okay, just be really careful that you don't get drunk on your own success because you will stop listening, and that's how sneaky pride is. And pride blocks wisdom but not only is success intoxicating failure is humiliating could i get an amen from the guys i don't know what the girls feel about it it's like i don't want to fail i don't want to fail, fail at anything and yet i there are failures in my life it is painful to listen to advice in the areas where we feel like we're not measuring up It's so funny that, uh, you know, I, I recommend lots of different, uh, you know, let's have, how to have a good marriage books. Uh, Leanne and I try to listen to, talk, uh, uh, you know, the books, read, uh, all these kinds of things. Because once we, we had that, uh, that, that counseling, we want more. But it's like whenever a marriage is going south and both of them do kind of want to work on it, a guy starts to feel like, well, I'm the failure and I don't want to go talk to a counselor because he's going to tell me I'm the failure. And then a, a wife with all the best of intentions and ladies, this is the way you are and this is the way we are as guys. You get a really good book that I might have recommended to you and you read it and of course it has good stuff in it. I wouldn't recommend trash to you. Okay, so you get out three different color highlighters and you say, there's us, there's us, there's us. And then you, you, you come to your husband on one of those days like, honey, I really care about our marriage and I see some things that we could do better. And you know what? You could read this book. It's not gonna take you a really long time to read it because I already read it for you and highlighted the stuff that we need to deal with. <laughs> and either he runs from the room or he pushes that back to you and go, no, no chance. Why? Because failure is humiliating. And especially us guys, we do not want to have to, uh, uh, don't, anything that reminds me of my inadequacy and my failure, I'm going to resist it. And I, just, if you need to know you're in good company, Solomon did the same thing. But I'm saying, that's the subtlety of pride. Because pride's a trap. Pride is a trap. Success is intoxicating, failure is humiliating, and it's a vicious cycle. You see how it just feeds on itself. I don't gain any knowledge, so I'll go back and do it again. It makes me feel worse. It's just awful. But there is a way out. The way out is you've got to invite somebody into your area of weakness, wherever that is. And let them actually be with you right there in the middle of your mess. And while they're there, what you need to do is you need to practice. 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 And what are you practicing? Listening. Now the question I wrote down, because I'm perplexed about this, where in the world 
would you ever find anyone like that? Hmm. Gang, that's what Rock Springs is all about. This is our centerpiece. We look at God's word. He gives us wisdom. Some of us have lived a little longer of following Jesus than others. But you have to put yourself in the proximity of other people. So come to Rock Springs, not because we're all that, but because God's all that, because Jesus is all that, because his Holy Spirit is all that. That's why we say, not because it's a clever saying, who's got a purple shirt on? You belong here. You belong here because you fit into the mix of a colossal collection of moral foul-ups. It's the reason we're having the summit today because groups who get together with a common mission to meet a need through ministry, whenever we do that, it gives us an opportunity to also compare how is our life going? Iron sharpening iron. What's going on in your life? How can I help you? If we all come with this idea of listening to each other, then our teams and our groups, we're doing what it takes to grow some wisdom. This is why we exist as a church. So no matter how you slice it, everything I've said today, the answer to our question about knowing what we do not know, the answer relies in relationships. You cannot do this by yourself. So whenever you say, how could I have been so foolish? How could I have been so stupid? I should have seen it coming. Well, the God who loves you so much that he would rather die than be without you. That's why we've been singing about the cross you know, this morning during our worship time. He has arranged life to be lived in such a way that you're going with the grain of what he said about in life. He has arranged life so that somebody near you who loves him and loves you can see what's coming down the pike. Somebody who can see what you're pretending not to know and you have given them the permission to pat you on the back when you're doing the right thing or kick you in the rear when you're not. And that way... He builds a safe place to deal with a very dangerous message and he calls it the ecclesia. He calls it the church. We're not playing church here, folks. We are the church. And we need this wisdom because wise people know when they don't know, but they're not afraid to live and work and serve and ask those alongside those who do not know. So here's a slight twist. This is your takeaway. Ask this question. Slight twist on what we've learned. In light of your past experience and the, regret, the regrets, in light of your current circumstances of hearing God's word brought to you, in light of your past experience, your current circumstances, and your future hopes and dreams of being a wise guy or a wise girl, Just listen. You get it? Okay, good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I love you so much, and I'm so grateful that wisdom is actually uh, a part of your very character. Your character is so vast and has so much creativity and power and knowledge, but your character is, it is interwoven with wisdom. Wisdom. So to know wisdom is actually to get to know you just a little bit better. Would you help us by taking these ancient documents and what they have to say, would you help us to see where this truth, where this wisdom fits in our minds, in our hearts, in our lives and behavior? And then would you give us not only the strength, but the courage to actually act, act on it and to do what you've taught us to do. Because I'm confident, Lord, I've seen it in my own life before, but I want to see it more. I want to see it in the lives of people that I love. When we do this, you're going to bless us. It's, it's just the way you've made life to be. So as we're getting blessed, and then we get to opportunity to humbly, uh, but graciously share this with other people that we love, well, then our families get better, and our church gets healthier, and, and our church becomes more effective in this world. 
for reaching others with the good news of Jesus Christ and then growing people up to full maturity. <laughs> and then the beat goes on. So God, I love you. Thank you for giving us this. Please bless us in this way and then we will give you the honor and the glory and the praise. And we pray it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.